In order to understand the rest of our code, I think it's important to also understand how web requests work. If we understand how a web request works and some of the different parts of it, I think that the Go code becomes a lot more intuitive because it matches up pretty well with how at least I conceptually think of a web request and how the different pieces sort of are, are there inside of a web request. Um, I think it's also worth note or looking at because it's a very common question for people to ask, you know, how did you know to look there or to put that header? And a lot of these are things that aren't specific to Go. They're just something specific to web requests. So when you see people setting things like the content type header, these aren't things that they learned specifically in Go. They're things that they learned about web requests in general, and then they applied to whatever language they're using because those headers are going to be the same regardless of the language because at that point you're basically dealing with browsers and interacting with servers, and you need to set these things so that the browsers understand them. In order to understand a web request, uh, we're going to use Chrome. So you don't have to use Chrome, you can use whatever you want um, to try to do this. The big thing is that you probably need a network tab and some sort of developer tools. So to open these tools, I hit Command Shift C. Uh, there's probably another way to do it depending on your operating system. But the big thing here is that I want to get to the network tab and I want to be able to look at my network requests. So now I'm going to go to calhoun.io slash crash course on Go interfaces. And I'm going to go ahead and open this up. And you can see up top it loaded the page. Everything there is going on. And there's a bunch of requests going on here, which is basically the first one is loading the page. And then the page will tell my browser other resources we need. Like we need a font here. Um, excuse me. We need a, a CSS style sheet. We need some other stuff and it goes to download all those. But if I click on this first one, and then I go look at the headers, you'll see that there's a little bit of information here we can look at. For instance, first thing is the request URL. And in this, we have the protocol, which is HTTPS. Um, the two big ones you'll see is HTTP and HTTPS. The S basically just signifying that it's a secure connection and it's encrypted and you don't have to worry about like man in the middle attacks. The next bit here is the www.calhoun.io. And this is going to be the server that we are communicating with. So you can kind of view this whole URL as like an address and the server is telling it maybe what city to go to. And then this last part is the path, which is going to tell it something closer to like the apartment number or maybe the street and a house number um, that we want to go to inside of that city. Um, the one thing that makes it a little bit different though, is that the server is going to be something we communicate with using this domain here. So the domain's going to tell us, okay, we use DNS records. We look up that domain of www.calhoun.io. It'll tell us an IP address, which you can see down below. Um, and then we're going to use that IP address to connect to the server. And when we connect to the server, it's going to give us some information back. But from that point on, the server gets to decide how it's going to interpret this path and how it's going to send data to us. So this last bit is completely up to the server that's set up. So we could actually set up a server that regardless of the path you gave it, sent the same page back every time. Um, we could have it randomly give you a different page, even if you kept going to the same path every time. It might not be the most useful website, but you could do that. So this path part is something that your server is going to be using to try to figure out where the user is trying to go. And as we start to build out our web application, you'll see how we use that to sort of set different pages and to sort of help the user navigate across our application. Um, another thing worth noting here is that our request method is a get. There's a couple different request methods that are possible. We're going to look at those a little bit later in the course, um, but the main ones are going to be get, put, post, and delete. So um, they all sort of signify different things are happening depending on which one you have there. And then there's also things like status codes that you'll get back. Um, status codes usually mean different things such as uh, this was successful or it was a redirect or you know all sorts of different things. And there's there's some sort of standard ones that have general meanings, but but realistically, your server can return whatever it wants. So again, this is something that your server is going to pick the best one, and you'll see us doing that a little bit later in the course. Um, it's also worth looking at what happens when we go to localhost, because that might be a bit confusing as to why we have this colon 3000 part and what all is going on. So let me actually open another tab and go to google.com. And I wanted to do this with the there we go, network tab. So you'll see here that when we look at the remote address, we have that colon 443. And what's happening here is that when we have a secure connection, so HTTPS, the default port is 443. So the browser knows to just use that port because we're making a secure connection and that's the correct port. When we're working in local development, like localhost 3000, 
we're often not going to use that 443 port. We're going to define a custom port. And part of the reasoning for this is that it's easier for us to spin up a bunch of different servers if we're specifying the exact port for each one. So I might have one Go server at port 3000, another one at port 3001, um, and I can have a bunch of different servers all running locally at the same time if my project needed it. We aren't going to be doing that, but it is an option. The localhost part is like the domain, except it's just a sort of way of saying, don't actually use DNS and look this up, just use my local computer. Um, so localhost is basically just saying connect to this local machine. It's like a special word for that. I think that's everything we need to look at here with the domain. So let's go ahead and move on to the headers. So headers are gonna be data that we send to the server and then we get some response back. So you can see here, we just have a couple response headers like the content length, the content type, and the date. Um, we're not actually setting these on our server, so these must be getting set by default somewhere, but um, you, know, you can see they're being set here. And if we go to Google, you'll see that it's response headers. There's a lot more going on here. It sends back a lot more information um, that dictates different things. So there's a lot that a lot of them there. And we can see request headers. So these are things that the browser is sending to our server. So it's telling it things like, okay, I'll accept text slash HTML. Um, and a bunch of these other formats are okay. Um, it's telling it'll accept different encoding types and some different stuff like that. It's also passing some cookies here. So you can see our cookies are actually just headers that are being passed in when it makes the request. So the browser actually gets to decide if it's gonna pass those along or what's going on there. And there'll be, um, the browser will sort of decide that based on the domain and, and which cookies are associated with that domain. So the next thing is there can be a body, which you're not gonna see anything here, but if you're making like a put request, for instance, if we filled out a form and submitted it, um, that would be a post, not a put, but that would probably be a post request. And when you submit that form, it needs a way of sending that form data. So the request, instead of having it in the header, you're going to have a body that has that information and it's going to be encoded in some format. So you'll generally see a header that sort of says, okay, this is the format that we encoded all this stuff in so that the server knows how to process it. So you also get a response body, which is this response tab, um, which I don't know why it's not showing it there, but whatever. So you'll see here on our website, when we go to the local host request and look at the response, this right here is the response body. So this is what we're writing when we go back to our code. Um, this is actually the response body we're writing. So when we write to the response writer, that's to write the body. If we need to change things like headers or other parts of it, we use different parts of the response writer um, object that we have here. So as I said before, um, cookies are actually just headers. So if our server wants us to set them, I don't think there's any examples of it here. Um, no, I'm not seeing any. But basically our response headers, which would be here, would actually have a cookie that's called the set slash cookie. Instead of content dash length, it'd be set dash cookie. Um, and then you would tell it which cookies you want it to set. And these are gonna be pairs. So you'll have like a key and then you have an equal sign and then the value you want it to set it to. And this tells the browser that when it gets a response back from a website that it wants you to set some different cookies inside of the browser. So that's really how they're working. There's nothing special or magical going on. Um, it's really just a response back from our server telling the browser, hey, you need to remember these things. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, if we get to our Go code, and we're gonna do that in another video, but when we start looking at this Go code, I think a lot of that's gonna start to make a little more sense because we can start to look at things like the request and see what is the URL and what is the path that is being used to access our server. And with the response writer, we can actually start to write different things like the headers and see where they are. And we can actually use these network tools to look at our server and make sure those things are being set like we would expect them to be.